please join me in welcoming Boyd. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, due to time restraints, guys, I'm only going to uh, cover things very briefly, just get you to think about uh, the importance of early conditioning and development for dogs and make it mindful, okay? Put it in your conscious that can help all the working dog community if we're more aware of it. Okay, quick overview of what we do, who we are. Oh, sorry guys, I'm obviously pressing it the wrong way. Um, we provide dogs, as we said, for all these types of working type roles. Um, we have our own breeding program, primarily Belgian Malinois. Uh, we also import dogs, um, primarily from Europe, out of Holland and Belgium, and we source them from top local breeders, which includes Chris, who you heard from earlier, from Bon Farrell. Uh, we're currently training or raising 25 dogs, which as a breakdown is nine adults, seven young dogs and nine pups, and the breakdown on breeds is 17 Malinois, one Dutch, two Labs and five German Shepherds, and as I said, they hopefully will all be placed in working homes. Those that don't make it will go to pet homes or assistance dog type roles or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, the presentation, the main points I want to talk about are optimising the genetic potential of a working dog, the effects of early environmental enrichment, identification of key physical, psychological and behavioural requirements for different working tasks, and I am going to put a bit of emphasis on that because different roles do require a completely different behavioural and psychological profile, and we need to be a bit more mindful of that, and the importance and impact of a controlled and monitored pup and young dog development program. Now, there's plenty of information in the literature that, over the years that uh, emphasise this, and yet I don't see that we actually apply it. So it's not like I'm talking about anything that's too revolutionary. It's more to bring it to your attention, the fact that we're not doing much about it. So Coppinger talks about, regardless of the best genetics, and I, I'm, I agree you've got to have great genetics, and you want to be very selective, and you want to go to the best breeder, and I'm not denying the real importance of genetics. What I'm saying is that even if you've got great genetics, if you don't have the right upbringing, you're not going to achieve the potential that you could. A great genetic dog may still produce quite a good dog, but he won't be anywhere near as good as he could have been if he'd had the right developmental work. Dick Stahl, very well-known guy from Holland, trainer and instructor at police agency, written many books, talks about opportunities to develop the dog and to suppress unwanted behaviours. These are just examples in the literature. Coppinger, a uh, puppy that's raised in an impoverished environment, has, the sm has a smaller brain, literally. Okay, so, and by impoverished, we're talking about everything, you know, stimulation, I'm going to talk about it as we go through. John Paul Scott, dog who has the right experiences early, far more prepared for everything. So there's literature all over the place from trainers, scientists, behaviourists everywhere, and yet we're not really applying it. Lindsay, again, there's so much information out there. You can get a copy of my slideshow if you want any of this sort of stuff, so you've got these references. Okay, so quickly, transition age. A um, lot of disputes about it. From a behavioural point of view in the development of working dogs, Seven weeks seems to be the consensus with all the research studies. Um, some dogs are being held back for a lot longer. Many of you would be aware of the studies with the South African police where they kept the puppies for longer and they allowed the pups to watch their parents do working type activities like scent detection and stuff and they reckon it did help in that sort of study. And I'm a big fan of that. We do exactly the same thing with our dogs. But what we're saying is don't just leave them with the mother. So that in that instance, they separated them from their mother and they grew up in a separate environment. They just came together during working environments and that's what we're saying. So there's a lot of reasons, but the big one is, uh, is the increase in um, uh, fearful tendencies that occur simultaneously with the reduction of uh, the social tendencies. So they're less inclined to want to socialise from seven weeks on, you know, that's when it starts to reach its peak, and they're also more inclined to be fearful. So why would we wait any longer? <coughs> okay, uh, basically, the quicker we get them out there, the better chance they've got. We're wasting opportunity. Okay, uh, let's talk quickly about socialisation. It's already been covered. We all know the critical periods. I'm sure it's pretty, there's so much literature out there. I don't want to spend any time on that. Um, but I do want to focus on just a couple of key points with relation to that. And that is that w with regards to the environmental enrichment, the socialisation and, and that sort of thing with dogs, is that we need to be specific about what the future role is going to be. We need to... Uh, be more mindful uh, of 
cut, making sure that we've eliminated any of the problems. There is this bit of a belief system that uh, your short token visit, take him to the train station, take him to the beach once or twice, you know, take him to certain environments, and because you've been there once or twice or a couple of times, that we've alleviated that problem. Well, take it from me, it's not, because we have endless problems with dogs. That, um, and again, there's so much information in the literature there, down the bottom there, by exposing them early and consistently is what is important and people are leaving things too late and they're not doing enough consistency in their work. Okay? Um, unusual environments. Uh, when I say that I want the dog to have no response, you just watch this pup on an unusual surface. That's a grate that a lot of dogs tend to have problems on. You can see that the behaviour of the dog is that he really could care less. He's almost oblivious to the fact that he is in fact on an uncomfortable surface and that's what we're talking about. That's proper desensitisation, environmental enrichment, and anything less than that is going to create problems later on. The point is, we can't fix the problems later on. We, we get these problems, uh, we didn't solve them early, and they're always going to be in the way of, of working dogs who are on the line, okay? So I'm talking about scent detection dogs, explosive detection, law enforcement, military working dogs, the type of dogs that we work with. Um, little things let them down. Problems with unusual surfaces, problems with machinery, problems with a thousand things. The little things are letting them down. Okay? Even the fact the way they learn to go over obstacles. You notice this dog has his feet on all the, the barriers there. Those types of things, uh, if they're not done early, the dog tends to scramble over things and then when I need to train him to climb up a ladder or use his feet very carefully, it's incredibly difficult to teach an adult dog that hasn't been developed properly uh, to do those types of things. So being brought up the right way. Obviously machinery and large vehicles, so many dogs underdone in that, and specific environmental uh, conditioning relevant to tasks. So it's a search and rescue type application. Uh, if the dog isn't brought up the right way, then he just won't be able to cope with these types of things and he'll be let down. Uh, you know, we recently had a dog rejected from the military purely on gunfire sensitivity. Uh, they loved the dog, they said it was great. If we could get him over that problem, they'd have him back in a, in a heartbeat wasn't desensitised to that, wasn't, didn't get enough environmental enrichment, didn't make the grade, okay? So, uh, so many of the dogs that we get when we're sourcing dogs, adult dogs and, and the like, are just underdone in their environmental. Okay, uh, and you have to think outside the box and put the dogs in all sorts of applications. And again, if you are breeding for a working type application and you do want, or if you're involved in those processes, go to the training, go to the source and ask them what they need the dogs done, what, they, what sort of environmental enrichment desensitisation program they need and what sort of preconditioning work can you do if you're involved in that type of thing. And again, it doesn't have to be for my roles. This could be for anything, whether it be search and rescue or you know, assistance dog work. I'm sure there's a myriad of things. If the dog is properly exposed and properly prepared, then the chances of him being successful are so much better. OK, uh, moving on. So prior learning that impedes later learning or subsequent acquisition is referred to as negative transfer An early learning that is counter to what we want as an adult uh, will need to be rectified and that's a lot more difficult than it seems. So with our dogs, with our conditioning and development work, we raise a lot of our own dogs to make sure that they're not learning the wrong things and to make sure that uh, they know, uh, you know that their developmental work is on the right track. And what we really want is a positive transfer effect when the prior learning, the early learning, foundation learning, is actually conducive uh, to the later learning and is actually preparing the dog. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, I've got a couple of videos that I'll show you as an example of that which, which achieve the objective very quickly. So learning should be structured so that one event sets the stage for the other. And I mean, Steve talked about that quite a lot, especially yesterday, and uh, we definitely agree on it. I'm talking about it from a pup and young dog development. I, just to determine the wording there, we, we would call a pup up to about six months of age, a young dog, you know, from six months up to anything from sort of 12 to 18 months. We, we, we would say a pup is a child, a young dog is a teenager, and then we've got an adult. But those ages are arbitrary and, you know, if you set call a pup up to 16 weeks, some people will call a pup up to 12 months, fair enough. Okay, so, um, yeah, so developmental steps, guys. Um, so, show you a couple of videos here. Um, 
Now our aim of these steps is to keep the dog wanting to play the game. You notice the dog is self-gaming here, it's playing with the ball and we're trying to attract it, lure it back towards playing with the ball that we want it to play with. So as it ignores the other ball and uh, plays with our ball. So that would be like an early developmental step uh, in there. While we're developing dogs, that was a, a Labrador by the way, this one is a Dutch Shepherd, young dog, he's about uh, seven months old here. and. Uh, again, which he's still got a little bit of conflict, still struggling to let go, but starting to make the association that coming back to the game is what we want, as opposed to just running off with the object. And then um, as we progress, this dog now is, uh, this is one of Chris's breeding from Bonferrell, and uh, this dog is about 11 months old, I think, 10 or 11 months. And you see now that the moment he lets go of the ball, the dog loses interest and comes straight back into the game instantaneously. So this is a dog that's now got the idea that we want and this is this step-by-step -step developmental work. Okay? So he'll play the game for as long as there's activity, as long as there's a fight, as long as there's a game, but then he comes straight back. And uh, we're, this is an example of the right developmental process from a young age which gives us a dog which gives us uh, the objective that we want in the end. So this is now a dog can, doing a search. You notice there's balls all over the ground. He can grab the balls if he wants to. There's nothing to stop him doing it. Um, we can stimulate him with balls over there and teach him that there's a ball over there. He knows that the game only occurs at the source of the odour. Okay? <laughs> really doesn't care about it. Um, it's, you can see balls floating around all over the place but he wants that game, so he's there to stay in the game. So the proper developmental work gives us such a better product to work with at the end of the day, and that's really what we're talking about. And I'm not saying that you have to do that, what I'm saying is if you want to get the best out of your dog and you want to optimise it, then that developmental and conditioning process is uh, really, really important. Okay, so we try to think 15 steps ahead. We're actually thinking about what we want virtually as an adult, even when the puppy is, is a young age. And uh, that's something that, again, I want people to be more mindful of. Think about the end result and start developing it young, okay? Just make sure you're not developing behaviours and habits you don't want and make sure that you are developing behaviours and habits that you do want. Okay, so positive and negative transfer are not necessarily context specific. Good and bad early learning can carry on to later, of un, uh, later problems with unrelated tasks. So even when you think something isn't going to interact on something else, it does. And only through experience can you really learn those processes. And that's why we raise a lot of our own dogs. Okay, so uh, ideally all activities a young dog receives, you should be seriously considering the impact on later learning. And including that, I would say play and all of those types of things, okay? So pups can learn from a young age to be lazy uh, because they get everything for nothing. Uh, you know, rich boy syndrome, non-contingent reinforcement, etc. Uh, and also they can learn to the opposite, learned industriousness. So this is a young dog here. Uh, he's about six months old, being given simple tasks, so you know, just having to search for things, not being given things for nothing. Um, even with our puppies, we don't just necessarily put the bowl of food on the ground and there's your food. We put, place the food in places and we make the dog search for them or we give him little tasks or challenges or obstacles to overcome. So he actually feels like, I don't get nothing for nothing, okay? Life is, I have to put in an effort, I have to achieve something, I have to use my brain and the end result is great success and great reward. Okay, play, uh, brief touching on this because play is something that's probably not considered enough in working dogs. Um, it may exert profound neurodevelopmental effects on executive function and have significant and lasting epigenic uh, influences on the dog's behaviour, so we need to consider it. It influences a myriad of behavioural and psychological elements. The point I'm making, we have to, give play, we have to be mindful of play. It can, it can be good, but it can also be bad and we do the wrong thing you know, too often. People are developing the wrong behaviours. Uh, the wrong play can be totally counterproductive and uh, we're quite conscientious of that. So this would be a typical play activity that we would do, a structured play activity, specifically developing behaviours that we're looking for in the dog as he goes. So we don't just randomly let the dog play himself and make his own game and you know, learn things that we don't want him to learn and develop bad habits. We're trying to create all the right behaviours all the time. So even the play is structured effectively is what I'm saying. Okay, um, 
We discourage allowing dogs to make their own game too much, so we wouldn't generally leave toys in the kennel for the dog to just destroy um, and uh, you know get his own satisfaction. There's a whole myriad of reasons why we do that. It's beyond the scope of today. I'm sure you would have um, uh, you know your arguments for and against that, but um, we don't let our dogs do it. We have constructive things where we play exercises, etc., etc. Okay. Um, Research on tug of war for those who want it. No indications now is dominant. That's not John Bradshaw from Monash. That's John Bradshaw from England, which uh, Nicola has done work with. Uh, play strategies. We make sure that we're doing the right thing, preparing the dog all the time. Okay. Um, I'm going to flick past this one here. Conceptual learning. So I'm running out of time. Uh, there's so much information in the literature. I've put extra slides in there, guys, so if you get a copy of my slideshow, you can reference the material. We just need to make sure that the learning is exactly what we want all the time, otherwise we're not going to end up with the right things. Okay? Some things need to be left till later. I don't believe in training a dog to do absolutely everything when he's a young dog at all, and there are many things that we wait for. We train the dogs to do those things later. Okay? But if we don't do things early, we are not going to end up with the dog that we want. We need to make sure that the dog is brought up the right way and developed in the right way. So many different things, coordination, physical skills, development of active search behaviour in young dogs, sustained search motivation. I'll show this video, then I'll stop. Right. Getting the, the flag here. So this is the type of thing that we would want to develop in a dog. Okay, Super confidence, right environment, this is only a young dog committed to the search, knows how to search, doesn't care about what the environment is, works hard and just keeps trying and trying and searching and searching indefinitely. Okay. So that's what we're looking for, this sustained search motivation to end up with you know, a dog that does all the things that we would want. We develop, very important that we do discrimination exercises with young dogs. If we don't do them young, then they're so much harder to teach later on. There's extensive literature on early work with discrimination and how it impacts, okay? All right, I'm out of time, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Boyd. Would our speaker